This video is brought to you by the Chariotone Horsebreaker Professional Overdrive. The Horsebreaker crams two of the most highly sought after pedal circuits into one enclosure, offering the same uncompromising component and build quality seen in the Centura. Choose between buffered or true bypass switching and swap the signal path order for maximum compatibility with your pedal board. Legendary guitar tones can be yours for less with the Chariotone Horsebreaker. Available now at the link in the video description. Welcome back to Plagueside Studios everyone, Ryan here, and in today's review, I'm knocking out two birds with one stone with two petals that are pretty in pink, or lipstick, red, dark, salmon, whatever this actually is, with the HM300 and UM300 by Behringer. For one reason or another, it's actually been quite a bit of time since I've just sat down and made a plain review video. I've looked at a lot of plugins recently, but in terms of hardware, I've either evaluated a lot of discontinued products or, and, and, you know, analyzed pedals that I'm really into and some of this standard review stuff kind of falls by the wayside. But I thought it would be a good opportunity to look at the Behringer line of pedals because these are brand new. You can buy these things from whatever your favorite big box or online guitar store is. And I'm actually going to be looking at a couple circuits that are based on really legendary boss pedals. So now I don't have to make a video about those. So I've actually killed what four or five proverbial birds with uh, this proverbial stone. So we're going to talk about both of these circuits in depth and I'll make some recommendations based on what I think these things do well. But before that, let's just get into the Behringer compact pedal series in general, the things that will apply to these, no matter if you're looking at their compressors or overdrives or delays or even some of their all-in-one amp modeler simulation type things. So a lot of you are gonna be familiar with these. You've probably seen these used, whether it be in pawn shops or those aforementioned guitar stores. Um, but for those of you that may not know the history of these, these were actually introduced in, I believe, Winter Nam of 2005. They eventually released in the mid-2000s with this now iconic bubbly, I see someone say cheerful look to them. I mean, they're almost like artificial, right? This is Uncanny Valley stuff where um, I would expect to play maybe a video game that has a guitar rig rendered in the background for like, you know, background stuff on a stage or something. And, you know, if they made a pedal that looked like this, it'd be like, yeah, that's kind of what a pedal looks like, except they don't really look exactly like that. And yet here we are. This is, this is real life. Um, the reason they look this way is because they started off for all intents and purposes as complete boss clones. I mean, even down to the font. They were nearly indistinguishable. If you were coming up on their Winter Nam booth from a distance of, say, 20 yards, you would be forgiven for, you know, mistaking that as boss pedals, um, even down to the overall shape, the knobs, everything. Now, uh, eventually, Boss sent them a lovely cease and desist, and they settled out of court, and eventually they arrived at this design. Now, the aesthetics aren't the only thing that they borrowed from Boss initially, as a lot of these pedals are actually Boss circuits. While their pedal collection spans from your run-of-the-mill Tube Screamer knockoff all the way up to Sans Amp derivatives, a large part of their pedals are, for all intents and purposes, Boss circuits. Now, I would call at least the two we're looking at today basically indistinguishable, sonically. 
Some people said, you know, I've got this chorus pedal that's supposedly based on the CE2 and there's just a little bit of difference and maybe this one has just a slightly different gain structure. They probably, you know, changed a part or two around whatever. But in the grand scheme of things, they are basically the same. I don't have direct comparisons in this video because I don't own the pedals they're based on, but all the ones I've ever heard, no one's going to notice the difference in a live environment or a mix good enough. And in this case, good enough truly is good enough because at least these two pedals retail for a whopping $23 plus tax, brand new, shipped to your house for free. That is absolutely insane because for context, say if we take one of the simpler boss pedals like the SD1, you'd be lucky to find one of these for 30 bucks used in really great condition you know, maybe in the $25 range plus shipping if you're going online for something that's a little ratty, um, gigged a bunch, and you probably get something similar with no shipping if you're at a local music store or whatever, but that's used. There's still like 50 brand new, and you know, most of the pedals in their lineup range from $100 up. And of course, there's plenty of Behringer pedals that are more expensive in the $50 range. The question becomes then, how does one produce a guitar stomp box, sell it to a retailer, for a profit, that retailer then resells it to us for a profit off of a $25 revenue stream? Well, the short answer is if there's a corner, Behringer probably cut it. And it's not necessarily a bad thing on the whole, but there was definitely compromises that they had to make to make these things possible at their price points. The first thing to keep in mind is Behringer really doesn't have an external supply chain. They are kind of their own suppliers. For any other pedal manufacturer out there, they have to source their parts, you know, op amps, resistors, capacitors, and there's a pretty good chance they're actually sourcing from Behringer. They make a lot of those components in their factory campus they call Behringer City, which for the most part is basically a city in which they make all their audio equipment. And that is precisely why they can keep costs low. They cut out the middleman, you know, instead of shipping components across the seas, they take it, you know, down a conveyor belt or a dolly or a forklift, and that's only cost, is a little bit of time. As a result, the component quality and by extension, the circuit quality doesn't really suffer any ill side effects. It's basically comparable to any other big name manufacturer out there, but of course they had to have millions, if not billions of dollars in investments to make that happen. So there you go. The second thing is there's really not much of R&D cost with these because they're using circuits that other manufacturers already developed. You know, they can change a component here, switch up a drawing there, and ta-da, we have something that's legally protected. Whereas other manufacturers might have to make up for hundreds, thousands, if not tens of thousands of man hours that were poured into creating these circuits in the first place, Behringer can kind of just let everyone else do the work and, you know, make their tweaks and ta-da, we have a new product that yet again shaves off another cost that we don't have to pass on to the consumer. All that sounds well and good so far, but then we get to the physical product itself and as you probably noticed, the enclosure is not exactly the highest quality out there. This is indeed injection molded plastic, which does have its advantage because, I mean, for the most part, they're all kind of the same thing. You got some different um, hole placements for the potentiometers and, um, you know, even spacing and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, they have what, probably half dozen molds, if not just a few different molds and they replace this part. I don't know exactly how they go about it, but, you know, different colors, but same shape, high volume, that's going to cut costs insanely. Um, Unless you've looked into, you know, building your own pedals, it's hard to appreciate how expensive a lot of these enclosures are. Sometimes for, you know, a simple circuit, the enclosures, the jacks, the switches, all that kind of stuff, they can be far more expensive than the circuit that's actually inside, which is a weird thing to think about. Not, you know, the case for a lot of these, but um, if you make your own enclosures out of very inexpensive materials and you make a lot of them, then that cost becomes almost negligible at that point, even compared to the already high volume boss stuff. 
This, of course, doesn't come without its consequences because, number one, it just it doesn't feel good, quite frankly. Um, you know, you hit a new trick jack or even the boss pedals, and it's just satisfying to click. You know, you could feel it no matter which way you approach it. With this, it's just sloppy, and I wouldn't expect this to last more than a gig or two before something breaks because most of this is plastic. Um, so if you're kind of a heavy stomper, good luck with it. Now there's a couple ways you can overcome this, both of which are going to cost you time or money or both, but if you find it still to be a logical choice to, you know, save some bucks and go after a boss clone like this, then, you know, you can get around it. So the first thing you could do is throw this in a pedal loop switcher, whether it be MIDI controllable or not. That way, you could just keep this always on and then through scenes or presets, you bypass it when you don't need it and engage it when you do. Might look a little funny if you're using, you know, say the Strifecta or you've got a bunch of Morgan pedals or something like that. But, you know, if, uh, again, you find that to be a logical thing to do, then at least you never have to worry about the switch breaking. Another common practice is to recase these pedals entirely. So someone will rip out the guts and reuse the pots or maybe even change those out, almost definitely change out the input and output jacks and, you know, throw them into an enclosure that looks something more like that. Now you've got something that's, you know, kind of gig ready. Again, if you don't have soldering skills or you simply don't want to spend the money on it, then, you know, maybe that could be a problem. But because a lot of these pedals are so cheap, you still come out ahead versus, you know, used versions of the same circuit from the quote unquote authentic, or at least Gibson authentic uh, source. So some things to think about with that. For me, I think a lot of these pedals for the weekend warrior guitar player, someone that just wants to come home and jam after work, they're probably fine. And at the very least, they're a hell of a way to demo a circuit if you're not 100% sure about it. So you know, if you're just now getting into delay or reverb or there's kind of a distortion effect like these that you're interested in, Check Behringer and, you know, for 20 bucks or so, you can get a good idea. And if you, you know, like it well enough, then maybe buy the real thing eventually or do a couple of those other projects I mentioned to make them hold up um, for a more long term use case. So those are the sort of things you'll have to contend with no matter what Behringer pedal you choose. So keep that in mind as we talk about the boss derivative circuits I hold in my hand today which of course is the HM300 based on the legendary Swedish death metal chainsaw tones of the HM2 heavy metal and the UM300 based on the Boss NT2 metal zone. Probably from just saying those couple of phrases there, you've conjured some strong emotions because these are love it or hate it tones. And I think it's unfortunate because these pedals are a lot more versatile than people give them credit for. They just kind of have a stigma based on the lol, her, der, turn it up to 10 mentality, which in the case of the HM2, it kind of works for that one specific sound. But I wanted to use these typical configurations as kind of a diving board into how I would actually go about dialing in these pedals to sound more amp-like and why these get thrown under the bus a lot of the times unfairly. Sure, both of these have a lot of faults, but I don't think they deserve a lot of the hate that they get. So with that, let's start with the HM300 with everything maxed out. This is, of course, the death metal brutals type of tone that uh, basically everyone dials this kind of pedal into and never touches again. And then for the UM300, this one doesn't have, you know, kind of a specific setup. But if there was one, I think it's the stereotypically shitty sound of turn that distortion and level to max because who needs dynamics anyway? Crank lows and highs because we got to make it hi-fi and nuke the mids because this is metal. Who needs mids anyway? So let's have a listen to what those sound like through the effects loop of a tube amp, kind of using these as just, you know, your entire sound, preamp, distortion, all of it. And uh, we'll talk about why I think they mostly suck for all but a couple applications. <laughs>
be presenting some frequency response data here before we go into more tone demos, but kind of as a preface to both of those, um, one of the things I won't explicitly show here is the output level of these pedals, which can be a really useful thing if you're trying to kind of make a cascading gain stage thing of sorts and use high output level from a pedal like this to drive the front end of a high gain amplifier. A lot of um, bands do that just to get a super saturated tone. Um, kind of weird things with this pedal, the HM300 doesn't have a lot of clean output headroom with everything at noon. So, you know, even if you crank the level, it's not that much above unity gain. And in fact, at noon, it's rather low. Distortion doesn't really have that much of an effect on overall output level. You know, it becomes more compressed, so it's overall louder more of the time, but um, it's it kind of does what distortion is supposed to do. It doesn't affect the output level that much. It's only when you crank mids and lows that you get the overall level boosting effect. So um, if you want to have kind of a flat boost thing, this doesn't do that. Contrast that with the MT2 circuit, which even when dialed in rather conservatively on the distortion and EQ sections has anywhere from like four, seven, maybe even higher decibels of clean boost available, which is partially why bands like Cannibal Corpse popularized the practice of sticking this in front of, say, a rectifier type amp. So you get a little bit of crunch into a lot of crunch and it's being hit hard with a boosted signal. So it creates a cool kind of sound. And it definitely influences the way that I use both of these pedals since this is significantly lower in output volume with everything at noon. So keep that in mind again as we go forward. So let's start with the HM300 frequency response. With the low and mid control set to noon, or roughly noon, you know, keeping in mind manufacturing tolerances, the output frequency response is mostly flat, a little bit of attenuation on those high five frequencies below, you know, like 200 hertz and uh, three, 4,000 hertz. It's a decent, you know, kind of blank slate for a boost pedal because you kind of want to do that anyway if you're adding dirt to a signal, but it's kind of flat and boring. Now things get interesting when you start to mess with these low and mid controls. Um, say you turn them down and you get a, a pretty good chunk out of about 100 hertz up until about 200 hertz. So even if you want to make this like the heavy metal clean boost thing, you know, turning lows all the way down, you're still going to have quite a bit of bass content. It's better than nothing um, if you're going for that tube screamer style effect, but you're still leaving a lot of the chunk in here. So keep that in mind if you want to, you know, kind of put this in front of a Marshall or something like that. Now the mid controls, this is sort of a weird thing as it's not just a single peaking filter. It looks like two of them smushed together that creates a Batman ear effect, uh, is what I've heard it called before. Uh, sort of centered around that 1000 to 1600 hertz range, which is, you know, something that you could almost recreate with an EQ pedal alone. Um, of course, when you attenuate both of those, it's not going to sound all that good. But the iconic sound of cranking lows and mids, you get a huge mid scoop out of those low 200, 300 hertz frequencies, and then emphasize those mids, and you get this super honky, fuzzy bass boost thing that is so iconically HM2. You don't hear any amplifier sound like that or any other pedal design for that matter. And I think the heavy metal moniker is sort of a disadvantage for it because yes, it eventually got turned into the Swedish death metal thing. But uh, besides that, I find it to be a better buzz sound more than like a heavy metal distortion. And this is precisely why, just because it has this honky lo-fi, you know, bass boost thing that you don't hear anywhere else. The UM300's high and low controls are a bit easier to digest, which appear to be Simple peaking filters around 120 and 3 to 4,000 hertz, respectively. If you want more presence and depth, then turn them up. If you want less, turn them down. That's more or less how they operate. These are, again, hi-fi light controls that you wouldn't see in an amplifier's tone stack. They don't work that way, which is why I would still recommend using both of these pedals in front of a clean preamp. That way you get more fine tuning available for you. The middle controls are a bit of a different beast since you can actually sweep the mid frequency from 200 to 5,000 Hertz. So 
you know, closer to the middle, you'll get kind of a Mesa Boogie Mark series effect. You go all the way down to two to 300 hertz, you'll sound more like the HM2, or all the way up to 5,000 hertz, and you'll have basically no treble content left. So really sensitive, really powerful, and uh, it's one of those reasons that I think this pedal just simply does not get used correctly a lot of the times. Now, one aspect of these pedals that those frequency response charts don't capture is what sounds like a lot of pre-gain stage filtering going on. It's really aggressive with the UM300 in particular. Sounds like they're attempting that mid-focus tube screamer thing, but depending on what guitar you're using, it could sound like there's a cocked wah pedal on at all times. So I would have preferred to kind of had another control to uh, deal with that. But if you've got an EQ pedal, you can sort of fix this. Either way, it can be really aggressive and too much, depending on what guitar you're using. And I know like the Keeley mod, for example, attacks some of those filters. Um, it's much flatter on the HM300 just by ear, um, though I'm sure there's still some other stuff going on. So let's move on to what I would call the completely clean application, using these in front of either the effects loop of a tube amplifier, which definitely helps make these things sound better, um, or how you can plug these straight into an audio interface and record them with a cabinet impulse response if you want. But I prefer the power amp tones in there. It just sounds more authentic. So you'll notice compared to later settings, I do prefer to dial up the low end on both of these. Um, whereas, you know, later on, I'll kind of attenuate them. And mids I find sound pretty good around one o'clock on this pedal. Um, it doesn't get into that overly like again, cocked wall sound, but there's enough presence in the high end that sounds more tube-like, though I don't necessarily use this as like the heavy metal sound. This, I also keep a, a decent amount of mids, you know, it's not completely at that negative 15 mark, but I also find that that sweet spot lies around 10 to 11 for the cut frequency, and at least for the sound I'm going after here, I don't need distortion, you know, all that past noon, definitely before three o'clock. So this is kind of how I would use these in a direct application, if you want to call it that. Another common setup would be to run these pedals in front of a completely clean channel. Again, I'm going to be using a tube amplifier here because I feel it does help bring out some more authentic tones to it. And this is where, you know, starting to attenuate some of those low and high frequencies comes in handy because this is already doing a lot of that work for you via the tone stack and the tube response. And this is where I kind of want to use these as channel twos. You know, we got a decent clean sound, want to throw these on, not change the level all that much, which will depend on, you know, which pedal we're using here, and just make it sound like a high gain amp of sorts. With the UM300, this is more into that boosted dual rectifier 5150 kind of territory, though if you listen to one for comparison, it's obviously not the same, but, you know, it's, it's a decent compromise, I feel, especially for the price. This is more like a chunky kind of grisly hot rotted plexi or old school Marshall thing, um, which again, I think the heavy metal name betrays that a little bit. So um, here's some more clean tones.
like these don't just have to turn clean amps into dirty amps, you can turn a dirty amp into a dirtier amp. So that's what we're exploring next. As you'll see, my distortion settings keep going lower and lower since the amp is doing more of the work in that regard. And my EQ settings also become more conservative. So with here, I'm dialing off bass quite a bit and the magical kind of 10 to 11 o'clock region here tends to work really well. That's where you get sort of a well-balanced mid-hump type effect. Um, I like one of these quite a bit, actually. It has a nice transistory style sound while still having some of the hallmarks of tube amps. The other one, it's cool. I, you know, I can see why people would dig it, but definitely not my thing. At this point, some of you might be thinking, fine, some of this video has been informative. I've learned a thing here. Maybe I'll get this product. But what I really want to hear is that can of angry bees sound. Well, my friend, you are in luck because what happens when you cascade one of these pedals into the next, either this way or this way, is, um, well, it's something that I can only describe as 13-year-old angst because this is a tone that you know, myself at that age, I'd probably think, you know, that's, that is that angry bee's knees, so to speak. So this is the kind of sloppy playing that um, this setup inspires. But again, as you'll see, depending on which is first, you get some dramatically different tones. And once again, there's one that I certainly prefer over the other, but I'll let you decide which is best for your application. Thank you. 
To conclude this video, let's start big and work our way down to the minutia. And the overall concept for this video was less of a specific Behringer review, though hopefully I delivered something like that, um, and more of an evaluation on distortion pedals in general, and looking at a couple extremely iconic circuits from Boss. It's just not from Boss in uh, this instance here. And what can I say? You know, I'm not going to change anyone's minds about these things, I have a feeling. But in my opinion, the Metal Zone is the better pedal for sounding like an amp. The HM2 circuit is a better pedal for sounding different because I can't name really any other pedal or, you know, amplifier that sounds that way on its own. So to get a certain tone, yeah, it's more unique and is kind of neater in that aspect. But as a channel two stop box thing, this sounds more like a regular boosted tube amplifier, if that's what you're going after. So they definitely both have their merits. This is more of a traditional metal sound to me. This is like overdriven fuzz, and I would want to put something in front of it to uh, kind of tame it a little bit, or at least accentuate some of the frequencies I like and cut the ones that don't. Um, you know, if you're going after that chainsaw tone, then yeah, you can throw this in front of a solid state amp and probably have a fun time with it. But uh, it's it's not my bag. Now, when it comes to the Behringer pedals as a whole. Again, if you're kind of one of those budget constrained, don't play guitar for a living, don't have a setup that would warrant, you know, spending a hundred to two hundred dollars on a pedal, then absolutely, you know, uh, these have a really good place for those kind of people. And you know, something like the Metal Zone is the value that high? It's decent, you know. We're looking at maybe fifty to seventy percent off of a used price for you know, a decent shaped MT2. For the HM2 knockoffs though, you know, the cheapest, terribly, you know, wrecked, awful condition HM2 pedals are going for like a hundred bucks at least. You get into the made in Japan ones, black label, good shape, north of 200 sometimes. So if you want to at least experiment with that tone, and if it's something like me where this is kind of a gimmick, uh, then $23 is a lot easier uh, to swallow compared to 10 times as much. So that's kind of where I stand here. Um, the Behringer platform definitely has problems. The circuit is not one of them, though, and I'm very impressed with that aspect of it in terms of the authenticity and how close they were able to reproduce the uh, the source material here. The enclosures kind of suck, <laughs> but what did you expect? Um, at the very least... These put a smile on my face. That's something I can't say about a lot of pedals. They're just so like, they're fake. Like these look like Chinese knockoffs. I mean, I guess you could call them that in the derogatory sense, but there's more care behind these um, in, in some sense of that word. And I, I like them enough. I want to hang on to them for a while. They're, they're fun to have. Um, maybe I'll look at some other ones later on. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much my take on them. They are... Very interesting uh, in terms of kind of looking at the guitar world through the lens of IP and trademarks and copyrights uh, and seeing, you know, how a, an iconic circuit can and will be recreated. So if you like those tones, this ain't a bad spot to uh, start in. Just be prepared to do a little extra work if you want to hang on to these for a while or use them in a professional sense. Any other questions, comments, as always, please leave them down below. We will see you next time. Thanks for watching. Bye.